To this day, I've still got really vivid childhood memories of visiting my local branch of Ryman. Now, if you live in the UK, you're probably familiar with Ryman, a stationery shop where normally you go for like a pack of photocopier paper or a ring binder. But back in the early 90s, it was actually quite an exciting place to visit because back in the day, they sold computers and technology. And believe it or not, it was actually in my local branch of Ryman where I first got to see games like Wolfenstein 3D and Doom for the first time. And also, I got to play with a little device that really captivated me, the then new Apple Newton. Now, admittedly, Ryman might seem an unlikely place to first witness groundbreaking technologies like a benchmark FPS game and the world's first real PDA. But in a way, it did make sense that the Newton would be in a stationery shop, as it was in many ways, trying to replace the more traditional pen and paper products that they were selling in there. The Newton came out of Apple's wilderness years, as many Apple fans like to call them. Development started in the late 1980s, and then they were exploring various ideas for portable computing. In fact, they spun a whole company out of Apple called General Magic, with the goal of essentially inventing what we'd know today as a smartphone. Now, there is a recent movie all about General Magic, which is absolutely worth a watch. And we did a podcast with the movie's producer, Matt Maud, recently. So if you want to find out a bit more about the story of General Magic, I'll put a link in the video description. Although, bizarrely, Apple themselves betrayed General Magic by releasing this device, the Apple Newton, which was really a competitor to the technology that General Magic were making. And it was all very weird. Apple made some quite frankly bizarre decisions during those years, and it was no real surprise that they were on the verge of bankruptcy by the time Steve Jobs returned in the late 90s. But that's a story for another video. So what was it that first interested me so much about the Newton when I laid eyes on it back in the early 90s? I recently picked up this model, a Newton MessagePad 130. Now, this wasn't one of the first machines. In fact, this one dates from 1996 and does have some slight improvements over the original 1993 MessagePad. Really, it's just got a bit more memory, better battery capacity, and a newer version of the operating system. Otherwise, it's identical. It's got the same ARM 610 CPU, which was part of the original ARM processor family and was also found in machines like Acorn's RISC PCs, running at 20 MHz. And it does feel quite heavy in the hand. And as you can see, it's quite a decent size too. I thought for comparison, we compare it to my iPhone XS. Now, of course, the Newton is bigger, but bear in mind, it's 25-year-old technology, and this was very portable for the time. And besides, combat trousers with really big pockets were quite trendy then anyway. Under this rubber cover on the side, we've got an Apple serial port that can be used to connect the Newton to a PC or a Mac. More on that later. We also have a PCM CIA slot here as well that can take full-size PC cards, and the eject button is here as well. And as you can see, the previous owner of mine had it online via a Nokia cellular card that I imagine probably hasn't got contract or credit anymore. On the top of the Newton, we've got an infrared receiver and transmitter, and you could actually beam data to another Newton using this. On the side of it, we've got a contrast control and a power switch. And on the bottom, there's a lock for the PCM CIA port and the battery compartment. Now, this model takes four AA batteries, and it does give you pretty reasonable life out of modern batteries, around 30 hours of light use. And there's also a coin cell CR2032 battery there as well for backup. Now, this has got non-volatile flash memory for your data, and this particular model has got an 8 megabyte ROM and 2.5 megabytes of RAM. On the front of it, we've got the classic rainbow Apple logo and the device name proudly displayed underneath. And then, of course, we have the screen. Now, you open the Newton screen by pressing the eject button on the front of the unit, and then, this is actually pretty cool, you can fold back the front cover, and then it clips nicely onto the back, so it's not just flapping around. And here, we've got the 320 by 240 monochrome screen. And this particular model has actually got a backlight you can activate if it's dark, which is quite handy. And it is a touch screen, but to use it, you have to use a stylus, which you'll find here. Now, it is a telescopic stylus, and it quite neatly hides and stays inside the top section of the unit. And there's a dock at the bottom of the screen. Now, these are actually not proper icons. Really, it's just a printed bit of plastic underneath the screen, but you can actually launch applications just by tapping on them. 
And if you know anything about the Newton, you'll know that its main selling point, and often the thing that it was ridiculed for, is its handwriting recognition. And this was one of the main features that Apple tried to sell it on, but to be honest, it didn't work all that well in the earlier models. This Newton has got version 2.0 of the Newton OS, which did offer some big improvements over earlier versions. I do actually remember how awful the first Newton I used was as a kid in that Ryman store. It could barely recognise what I was writing on the screen. But this model, with version 2.0 of the OS, actually does a half-decent job. And it is very intuitive. If you, or maybe more likely, the Newton, makes a mistake, you just scribble it out. And you can also draw shapes that it will correct and manipulate and move them around the screen. And there's also a rather fun freehand drawing mode as well. And if it's not doing too well with your handwriting, there's also an on-screen keyboard, which is actually quite like what you'd find on an iPhone today, only obviously controlled by a stylus. Then, when you had your note written, you could print it, or even fax or email it, or beam it to another Newton nearby via infrared which was pretty cutting edge for the time, and certainly would have made the Newton more useful than just keeping your notes on the device. And you get all the usual Office apps on here as well, including a calculator. There's also a clock and a calendar that I've got a feeling is not actually Y2K compliant, as every time I try to set it to 2020, it keeps reverting back to 1993. But pretty much it's got all the things you'd want as a busy business go-getter back in the early 90s. So that's what's on the Newton out of the box, not all that exciting, but you could actually download some other applications as well, including, believe it or not, games. Now next, we're going to have a look at some games running on the Apple Newton. And before we get into the games, you may have noticed that recently I've been making a lot more YouTube videos, which is something a lot of you have been asking me to do for years, and I'm making 2020 the year that I do it. Because the start of a new year is a great time to sharpen your skills, learn new ones and get a lot more into your passions. Now this video is sponsored by my good friends at Skillshare and their incredible online classes are a fantastic way of doing this. Now Skillshare are a huge online learning community where millions of people from all around the world come together to take their next step in their own creative journey. And they've got thousands of classes designed for creative and curious people on all kinds of topics ranging from illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing and lots more, all in easy to digest parts. Now I mentioned that 2020 I'm upping my game on YouTube, but also I want to do it in other areas of my life too. And I've been following Thomas Frank's How to Build Habits That Last Life Skills series and found it absolutely invaluable. Now he gives you real world tips and advice on building the life and the career that you want and how to prepare for these successes and bumps that you'll encounter along the way. And that's just one of the amazing classes you'll find on Skillshare which is also incredibly affordable, especially when you compare it to pricey in-person workshops with an annual subscription being less than $10 a month. Now I want you to join me on my journey and become part of the Skillshare community and I've got an amazing offer that you have to be quick to claim because it's strictly limited to the first 500 of my subscribers to click the link in this video's description and you will get two completely free months of premium membership so you can explore your creativity and passions. So claim it quick thanks to Skillshare. All right, now let's get back to installing software on the Newton. Now, if you want to do this, you have to actually connect your Newton up to a computer. And they did release the Connect software for both PCs and Macs. And as I mentioned before, the Newton uses Apple's old proprietary 8-pin DIN serial port. Now, I bought a third-party cable off eBay as the original official ones actually go for quite a hefty price today. But I did make one fatal flaw. Now, it's a right connector at the Newton's end, but on the other end, I got it to connect to a 25-pin serial port. And it turns out the oldest Macs I've got have actually got USB 1.1 ports, and the oldest PCs in my possession have got 9-pin style serial ports. Now, of course, you can get adapters, but I haven't got any handy. So that means I'm either going to have to order something off eBay and wait a week or so to finish the rest of this video, or we have to get a bit creative. So while I was looking around my home office for a solution, I spied my trusty Amiga. Now, I did remember that the Amiga actually has a 25-pin serial port, 
and of course the Amiga bin 68K based, it actually runs Mac emulation really well. So using a gender changer which I had lying around, and launching Shapeshifter, the Mac emulator on my Amiga 600 with a Vampire 2 accelerator. I spent a few hours downloading all the Newton Connect software and installing System 7, getting it all set up ready to go, and then, with the help of a lovely guy called Powell, who actually runs the applenewton.co.uk website, managed to get the software ready to connect to my Newton. Unfortunately, try as I might, I couldn't get the Newton and my Amiga running Shapeshifter to establish a connection together. It could be something to do with the cable, maybe the gender changer, maybe something to do with Shapeshifter's implementation of the serial port. Either way, it was getting on for about 11pm and time was running out for me to do this, so I thought we'd have to try another solution. But it turns out, there is actually a pretty old but decent Newton emulator that runs on Windows, Macs and even jailbroken iPads, and it's called Einstein, and I managed to get this up and running on my Pal Mac G5. And the next thing is, where do we find the software? Well, that's another few hours on forums and Google as well. It turns out actually getting software for the Newton is quite hard. Most sites just kind of mention software names that were released back in the 90s, or they're just sites full of dead links. But finally, I did find one really good resource, and pretty much the only one, with a comprehensive list and downloadable Newton software on there, the Una Backup Server. And they're all laid out into different categories as well, including games. Now, I'm not sure how many games were released on the Newton, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was nearly all of them. And installing the packages is really easy. All you do is download them and then click Install Package from the Einstein emulator. And here are a few games running on the Newton, including a rather fiddly but actually quite playable version of Columns, of course, there is a chess program available too, which makes sense, you know, thinking of the market this would have been aimed at. There's a backgammon game as well, which not really knowing how to play backgammon, I can't tell you if it's any good. There's a game called Bricks that might look quite familiar. Now, in all honesty, I'm not sure how much better they run on real hardware, but either way, I do think it's really cool that there was third-party software and there were people developing software for the Newton back then. They even had a web browser that I didn't have much luck with, but, you know, it's awesome that it's there. It's kind of like, you know, the 90s version of the iOS App Store, admittedly on a much smaller scale. So that's been a look at the Apple Newton, another piece of technology that definitely had ambitions way ahead of its time. And despite the fact that it wasn't the success that Apple hoped it would be, and it was in fact the first product that Steve Jobs killed when he returned to Apple, there's no denying that it did set the benchmark for what was to come over the next couple of decades. And you can see that the Newton was the granddaddy to modern devices like the iPad and the iPhone. So for that, I do find it interesting, and I think it does actually deserve a bit more respect than it tends to get online these days. So if you've got any memories of the Newton that you'd like to share, I'd love to hear a comment from you. And if you've enjoyed this video, why not check out my weekly retro gaming podcast? Now, speaking of Apple, we've actually been joined by the legendary Trip Hawkins on our show this week. Of course, he's the founder of EA, but also he was a very early employee of Apple as well in their very early days. And we got some great stories from his time working with Steve Jobs. So if you want to check out the latest episode of the Retro Hour podcast, you can get it from Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, or head to our website at theretrohour.com. And while you're here on YouTube, you might want to check out another video of mine and maybe consider supporting my channel on Patreon if you'd like to see more videos like this. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week.